So good to see you all this morning. Uh, maybe some of you, uh, you remember a phrase that your parents said, or maybe you've said this, somebody. The phrase in my household went something like this, as long as you're living in my house, <laughs> and we can all fill in the blank, right? Every house has rules, right? I, I, I'll tell you honestly, I will never resent that phrase because I remember the one time my father said that to me very clearly. He said, as long as you are in my house, I'm a 17-year-old kid. We just moved from North Carolina to Washington, D.C., and I wanted to stay in my room and do nothing else. And he said, as long as you're in my house, you're going to youth group. I said, I don't want to go to youth group. I don't like those people. <laughs> he made me go. I got saved. So as long as you're in my house is not a bad phrase to me. But, you know, we all have these as long as you're in my house rules. And sometimes as we get older, we, we let those rules change a little bit. But my point is this. Every house has rules, right? When I was growing up, we knew in our house we ate dinner at 6 o'clock. What that meant for me my senior year of high school was I had to cook dinner and have it on the table by 6 o'clock because my parents were going to roll in there and eat. But the unwritten part of that rule was if you ain't here at 6 o'clock, you have expressed to us that you are taking dinner into your own hands. We were not one of those families that set aside a plate for you. You weren't here. That's on you. There are rules in households, and every household has a rule. And the reason I mention this is because God says that the church is his household. And so we're starting a study today. We're going to be walking through the book of 1 Timothy. As we walk through the book of 1 Timothy, we've actually titled this God's Household because as we walk through it, Paul's going to be giving us directions for what it means to be part of the family of God and to live in his household. Now, before we go there, let me give you a little bit of background. I'm going to warn you really quick. I'm a history nerd. Actually, some people say you don't really need to put history in front of it, just nerd will do. But here, here's the thing. I like history, so when I get into the background stuff of this, I can, I can kind of geek out and nerd out on it. I'm going to ask you, just bear with me for a minute. Show me grace, because I think some of this stuff is kind of important, that we need to understand what's going on. And one of the things I love when we look at the background of these books is this. It reminds us that our scriptures exist in time and place. Why does that matter? If you ever read some of the other holy books around the world, they read like fairy tales. They start with something like, well, once upon a time, or in a galaxy far, far away, or what have you. But basically, they don't want to have any, any details surrounding the story because they want to be able to make it up as they go. But God in his grace has given us a holy book that he sat in place and time. And so when we read through the book of Acts and we see the things the apostles were doing, we can actually line it up with history and we can say, yeah, this was actually going on. This was real. This was true. And he does the same thing with the, with the books, the epistles of the New Testament, where Paul is writing letters to people. It's important that we understand where it's happening in place and time and who the people involved are. Now, the first thing I want to share with you is who, who wrote this book? When we talk about who's writing a book, it's always safe to guess with Paul. You guys remember being in Sunday school and the teacher would ask you a question, the answer was always Jesus or read the Bible? It's kind of the same with, hey, who wrote this book? Usually it's Paul. Okay? In this case, it is Paul. Paul's writing this book, and the date and time that he's writing this book, he's writing this book probably between 62, 63 A.D. He's in Macedonia. He is either just about to go into prison or just about coming out of prison. All right? you know, by the way, that's pretty much the, the timeline of Paul's life. He's in and out of prison. He was a repeat offender. The recipient, though, is interesting. He's writing to a young man named Timothy. We don't know a lot about Timothy. Here's what we know about him. He's a young man from Lystra. Now, what I, I, when I was reading that, I realized, you know what happened to Lystra? Paul went into Lystra and he preached the gospel. Actually, he went into Lystra and he healed a lame man. And the people got so excited, they thought that Paul and, and his companions were gods. And so they started to worship him. And Paul said, no, 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 we're not gods. And then the crowd turns on him. And they stone Paul. They drag him out of the city and they stone him. And they leave him for dead. And you know what Paul does? He gets back up, and he walks back into town, and he preaches some more. I don't know, Paul. But what, what struck me was Timothy either saw that or heard that story. He knew who Paul was. 
Okay, so here's, here's this young man, he's from Lystra. We don't know how old he is, probably he's, he's in his 30s. We have this idea, sometimes he's a teenager, but really he's probably closer to his 30s. And he had a very close relationship with Paul. Paul actually in other places calls him my true son in the faith. He says to one church, I have no one like Timothy who will look out for you, who will care for you just like I would. They have a, a strong love bond between each other. Um, they, uh, we know that Timothy had a, a godly mother and grandmother who taught him the scriptures. And we know that he believed so strongly in the gospel that when the gospel came, Timothy was a mixed heritage. His father was a Gentile, his mother was a Jew. And apparently, he was raised as a Gentile. But when he accepted Christ as a Savior, he said to Paul, I want to travel with you and I want to preach with you. And Paul said, well, we're going to go to Jewish areas. So if you want to go with me, in order to not cause offense since you're Jewish, you have to get circumcised. And Timothy believed so strongly in the message and was so willing, he said, okay, I'll do that. Now, it's interesting. Paul only did that, by the way, because Timothy had Jewish heritage. Because we see another young man named Titus who Paul says, you can go with me wherever you want to go. I'm not going to listen to those Pharisees who are telling you what you have to do because you're a Gentile. So that's a whole other thing we can get into. But here's, here's the thing. We see this really close relationship. He's one of Paul's two right-hand men. There's Titus and there's Timothy. These are the guys that Paul, whenever there's an issue, he sends one of these two guys there. But Timothy, there's a special relationship there. And there's such a special relationship that when Paul plants a church in Ephesus and spends two years there building this church and getting it to grow and doing all these things, and he feels called by God that it's time for him to leave Ephesus and start his travels to Jerusalem to end his life, he says, who can I trust? Who am I going to leave behind to pastor this church that I've invested so much of my time in? And he said, Timothy. I'm leaving Timothy here. So Timothy becomes the pastor, actually probably more of a bishop, of Ephesus. There are probably several house churches that Timothy's overseeing, and he's been instructed by Paul to stay and oversee. Which brings us to the next thing. The recipient is Timothy, because Paul's trying to instruct Timothy on how to lead this church, but it's also to the Ephesian church. Ephesus is an interesting place. If you go, if you go through the book of Acts, lots of things happen in Ephesus. It's in Ephesus where Paul starts preaching the gospel, and so many people come to know Christ that they stop worshiping Artemis, who was the goddess of the city. And it upsets the entire economy of the city. And so they start a riot to come after Paul. It's in Ephesus where the gospel is proclaimed and these Jewish exorcists decide, you know what, hey, I hear that Paul's casting out demons in the name of Jesus. We're going to try the same thing. The guys are the seven sons of Sceva. Interesting story in the scriptures. Because they come in and they say to this demon, possessed man, they say, listen, in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches, we tell you to get out of this man. And you know what the demon says? I know Jesus. I've heard of Paul. Who are you? And the next line says, and they beat them naked and chased them out of the house. In Ephesus, the Holy Spirit comes so greatly that a huge group of sorcerers and magicians accept Jesus and they burn all their books. In Ephesus, Paul, through the gospel, is turning the world upside down. And it actually becomes a center for the early church. Because not only did Paul minister there, Apollos ministers there. Not only did Apollos and Paul minister there, John the Apostle ministered there. As a matter of fact, according to church tradition, when John received Mary, the mother of Jesus, into his care, in his later life, before he goes to the Isle of Patmos in, ex in exile, in Mary's later life, they move and they live in Ephesus. It's an interesting church, too, because uh, it receives multiple letters. You know, for instance, if you look at your Bible, there's a letter that says Ephesians, right? That letter was written to the church in Ephesus. There's also these two letters of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. So Paul cared enough about this city and this church that he wrote three letters to them. But even more important than that, even more interesting than that, they actually receive a letter from Jesus. If we look at Revelation chapter 2, there's these letters sent to the seven churches. One of them is Ephesus. And Jesus rebukes them and says, hey, you've forgotten your first love. It was a center for the early church, but also on top of that, not only was it a center for the early church, it was the capital of the region. So there's a lot of politics happening there, a lot of important stuff happening there. It was the center for the worship of false gods. We already mentioned the magic and the sorcery. There was also a temple of Artemis there 
which engaged in um, fertility rights, and was also right on, right on the trade routes. All right, why am I telling you all this? This is a big city. This is an important city. And there's a lot of distractions happening in this city to maybe get the church off path, which is why Paul writes so many letters back to them. So what's going on in Ephesus right here? I told you I was going to nerd out. Hopefully you got stuck with me that far. All right. What's happened in Ephesus? What's going on in Ephesus? At this point where we're looking at this, at this book, Paul has been called by God. He's being drawn inexorably towards Jerusalem. <coughs> People are telling Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. They're going to kill you. And Paul's saying, I have to go. God is calling me. And he's working his way towards Jerusalem. So he says, I have to leave Ephesus where I've served for all this time. And I have to start heading. And I'm going to leave Timothy behind because what has happened is there's this good church, there's this core church that is growing and it's making an impact, it's changing the city, it's turning the world upside down, but at the same time, there are these false teachers that are coming in and they're making a mess. And so Paul says, all right, Timothy, here's what I want to give you. Here's my reason for writing you this letter. He says, there are two things I want you to do. First, I'm giving you this instruction to stop to order certain false teachers to stop teaching. And I'm giving you orders on how the church should be organized. Because these false teachers are coming in, they're making a mess, and there needs to be an organization of the church to make sure that the church is growing. So, with that said, there are two main reasons, all right, to refute false teachers and to set up the organization of the church. Today, we're going to major on that first reason. We're going to talk about the false teachers, because that's the first thing, and actually, I think that's the main thing Paul's really getting at in this thing. He said, listen, these false teachers, if they don't get stopped, if, they don't, if somebody doesn't refute them and turn them away and shut them down, they're going to make a mess of this church before very long. So Paul gives to Timothy this main command to refute false teachers. Let's look real quick. 1 Timothy chapter 1. We'll read verses 1 through 11. Paul says, An apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculation, rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. I want you to see here, Paul gives right here, in verse 3, he, he jumps out with Timothy. He says, as I urged you when I was leaving, when I was heading to Macedonia in order to start my trip back, I gave you a command. I urged you to go and stay in Macedonia, to or stay in Ephesus, so that you could charge certain persons. It's interesting to me. Paul has people in mind. He probably told Timothy, hey, this guy, keep an eye on him. And this guy you need to go talk to. He says, I would left you there to charge certain persons not to teach any." different doctrine. See, the big concern that Eph the Ephesian church is following, is, is, is facing, is this. Even though they've had the Apostle Paul with them for two plus years, even though John has ministered there, even though Apollos has ministered there, there are still false teachers. And these false teachers are coming in, and Paul says, I want you, Timothy, to tell these people to stop teaching a different doctrine. Now, real quick, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of speculation about who these people are. Some people say, well, these people are, are what are called the, the Gnostics. The Gnostics are a sect 
that exists in the first century. It comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means to know. And they claim to have secret knowledge. And, and the, big, the big belief of these people was that the flesh was innately evil and the spirit was innately good. And so what they did was they said, well, if my flesh is evil anyway, I can do whatever I want with it. I can, I, there's no such thing as sinning in my flesh because my flesh is already evil. They actually went so far as to say, since the flesh was evil, Jesus could have never had a body. That's why when you go to the book of 1 John, John is fighting with the Gnostics. And he says to them, he says about Jesus, I'm not telling you about something I heard, I'm telling you about something I touched, something I felt, someone who I was with who had a body. So their, their upshot was that they became very licentious. Other people think that these are the Judaizers. How many of you have heard of the Judaizers? Judaizers are Paul's old friends. They were Jewish believers who went around saying, hey, it's great that you accepted Jesus as your Savior, but you know in order to really be a Christian, now you have to convert to Judaism, you have to follow the Old Testament law, you have to get circumcised, you have to do all these things. And Paul over and over again says, no, that's not the case. Other people think they might be the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans we don't know very much about. They seem to have been a licentious group. All we know about them is in Revelation 2, Jesus says to the church, this I give you as credit, you hate the Nicolaitans just like I do. Okay. Here's the thing. I told you all that to tell you what people think. I'm going to tell you this next thing real quick. I don't think any of that matters. I don't think it really matters which false doctrine he was dealing with. Paul is saying, tell them not to introduce any new doctrine. It doesn't matter which cult it was. Paul is saying, Timothy, you have to oppose these people who are bringing in these cultic teachings. And what's most important is this. When Paul says... Doctrine. When we think of doctrine, we have a different understanding of what Paul thinks of doctrine. When we think of doctrine, we often think of the minutia, the, sm the small things. We think, about, we think about things that are secondary to our faith. When Paul talks about the doctrine, you know what he really means? He means the gospel. What's happening with these, he, what he's saying is, Timothy, don't let anybody else bring in any other gospel than the one that I've already preached to you. Because Paul lays out his doctrine in his writings. And his doctrine is always this, the gospel of God. And he says to Timothy, don't let anybody else bring in any other doctrine. What I think is more important than which cult we're dealing with here is this. Paul is giving instructions to oppose these false teachers. And as I was looking at this passage and I was looking at this, his description of the false teachers, it's interesting, he never describes their doctrine, but he describes their behavior. He never describes what their core beliefs are, but he describes what they're doing that's causing misleading of the church. And I think it's interesting because, you know what? When I looked at this, I said, you know what? False teachers haven't changed in 2,000 years. What we see in 1 Timothy is the behavior of false teachers, and we see them happening the same way today. And so what I want to do is I want to look at some of these characteristics of the false teachers that Paul puts out here and why we need to be on guard against them like Timothy is. First mark of, a false, of the false teachers is this. False teachers introduce a different doctrine. That's what we already talked about. I urge you when I was going to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, Ephesus. You may charge persons not to teach any different doctrine. Paul lays out his doctrine for us. If you want to, if you want to read Paul's doctrine, read the book of Romans. Romans 1 through 12, or 1 through 11, is an explanation of Paul's doctrine. Doctrine. Now, a lot of people get nervous about Romans because it seems very dense. But what Paul is actually doing is he's making a legal argument, but he's actually making a very simple argument. And in that simple argument, he, he lays out the gospel very clearly. First three chapters, he, he, goes, he goes through and he says, you know what? First thing you need to understand about the gospel is this. We're all sinners. It doesn't matter if we had the law or if we don't have the law. It doesn't matter if we were born Jewish or Gentile. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter whether you try to do right or don't try to do right. What matters is this. At the end of the day, because of how you were born in original sin and the, how you've behaved in your sinful actions, we all are sinners. And then he says, you know, we're all sinners. And, the, and the, the thing we deserve because of our sin is to be separated from God for all eternity. There's a judgment on sin because God is a holy God. He can't, be, he can't have sin in his presence. He can't have fellowship or relationship with someone who's sinful. And so Paul lays out, you're a sinner. You deserve judgment. 
And we get all the way to Romans. We go through Romans 3.23, we're told that we're all sinners. Romans 6.23 tells us what? That the wages of sin is death. We all deserve to die. We all deserve not only to lose our lives, but to be separated from God for all eternity in a place called hell. But then our favorite word is next, right? But the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's Paul's teaching. He says, listen, you're a sinner. You deserve to be punished, but God, in his grace, sent his son to die for you. And when he sent his son to die for you, Jesus took on himself all of our sins, all the things that deserve judgment. He took them to himself, and he paid the price for us. He says, but the what of God? The gift of God. The thing that is given to us by grace. So Paul's, Paul's doctrine is this. You were sinners. You deserve to be punished. Jesus died for you, and you can receive the forgiveness of your sins through what? Through the gift of God, which is his grace. And then Paul goes on from there. He said, by the way, he makes very clear, you can't earn it. You can't work for it. All you can do is receive that gift for what Jesus has already done for you. And if you add anything else to it, it's not a gift anymore, right? He says you can receive all this. And then from there... To the, to the end of chapter 11, he starts talking about what the gospel does to us. It changes us. It makes us different. It gives us a new identity. It gives us a new, a new standing before God. We're no longer sinners. We're now saints. We're forgiven. All these things. And what's amazing is nowhere in that section does he say, now that you've accepted Jesus, all these things can be yours if you will only do this. He says, because of the grace of God, all these things are already yours. God is for you. Who can be against you? You're more than conquerors. All these things. So Paul's, Paul's gospel is really simple. He says, you're a sinner. You deserve to be judged. Jesus died for you. He offers you forgiveness free, and all you have to do is receive it, and you'll become a member of the family of God. Now, what we see here is Paul says these false teachers are bringing in a new doctrine. They're bringing in a new gospel. When he says they're bringing a new doctrine, he's actually saying they're changing this message that I've been preaching you, that you can be saved by grace alone through the power of Jesus Christ. And they're doing something to it. And what they do is, listen, it hasn't changed in 2,000 years. They start removing one of those pillars. You'll hear these false teachers say something like, you know what? You're not that bad. I'm going to tell you something. You're that bad. I'm not bad. Because even our righteousness is filthy rags, right? But they'll say, you're not that bad. Hey, God would never send you to hell. He's just too nice for that. By the way, God has never sent anyone to hell. Our sins have sent us to hell. God has provided a way for us to avoid hell. They'll remove that and say, you know, it's, it's okay. It's just a big misunderstanding. By the way, if you really believe that, how monstrous is the God of the universe to cause his own son to die for your sins if there's any other way you could have been saved? That's a horrible, unloving God. The one we see more often, uh, the one I see more often, though, I think, I think we're all alert to that one, this idea that you're okay, I'm okay, no, we're not. I think we're all alert to that, but you know, you know what I see all the time? And what Paul dealt with all the time was, well, that's all good. Jesus' death opened the door. Now you can earn your way the rest of the way. So people will introduce a new doctrine by either removing our sinfulness or by making it our responsibility to get us saved and to get us pushing forward and to get us... We, we can't really have all these blessings till we do this, this, and this. Now listen, the, the Holy Spirit, when He comes into your heart as a result of you accepting Jesus, He's going to make you more obedient. He's going to change your attitudes and your minds because that's what He does. But don't fool yourself into thinking you've got to do all that in order to receive the gift of God's grace. You guys tracking with me? Here's the thing. People today are doing the exact same thing. They're constantly re reducing something from the gospel or they're adding something to the gospel. And whenever you do either of those two things, it ceases to be the gospel. And Paul's saying, don't let anybody else come in here and change anything I've taught you. How serious is this? Turn over to Galatians chapter 1. Keep your finger here. I promise we're coming back. I'm not preaching Galatians today. But Galatians 1 shows us how seriously Paul takes this.
Galatians 1, beginning in verse 6, he's talking to the Galatians, and the Galatians are dealing with the Judaizers who are telling him they have to keep all this law. And he says to them, I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But if even we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one who preached, we preach to you, let them be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. He repeats it. The word there is anathema. It means cursed to hell. Paul says, listen, there can be no other doctrine. There can be no other gospel. And here's what concerns me. We don't do real well at challenging false doctrine. We don't do real well at challenging a false gospel. I've been disturbed by how often the church gets this wrong. I've been, I've been disturbed by how often we'll embrace someone who preaches a false doctrine because they agree with us on other things. Not too long ago, I was watching something, and they had this, this gentleman preaching, and he was the sweetheart of this group, and he was held up as a great Christian, but he was preaching you have to accept Christ and get baptized or else you can't be saved. And nobody seemed to catch that that was a false doctrine. I want you to understand, we want you to be baptized. We're going to have a baptism coming up. But baptism is an act of obedience. It's not an act of salvation. And if you add anything to the grace of God, it ceases to be the grace of God. And so often we look at people and we say, well, you know what? I don't agree with him on this issue, but he's so good on all these. If, he, if you don't agree with him on the gospel, stop listening to him. If he's got the gospel wrong, he's a false teacher. Flip side of that is true. If you disagree with him on other things, but he's got the gospel right, show him some grace. We have brothers and sisters who don't agree with us on everything, but if they have the gospel right, they're our brothers and sisters in Christ. And you can have some heated conversations about those secondary issues, but if the gospel's right, give him grace. Come alongside him. We don't have to agree on everything. But the gospel, here's the, here's the thing. The gospel has to be our delineator. Not our worldview, not our politics, not our favorite sports team. There are Commanders fans who are believers, guys. I've met them. <laughs> the dividing line has to be the gospel, and so often we make it everything else. There's a cottage industry right now. They're called discernment blogs. Some of you have come across them. Basically, all they do is tell you everything that every Christian has ever done wrong in their life. And what I find disappointing is these discernment blogs very seldom show any discernment. Because they're not separating on the gospel. They're separating on all the other little things. And I remember I was reminded as I was watching one of them, these guys, you know real quick what they're against. You don't know real well what they're for. We need to be for the gospel before we're for or against anything else. So the problem... The first thing with false teachers is they introduce a different doctrine. Now, not every teacher is going to have a different doctrine that's just so, so clear that you can tell it, but you need to be looking and you need to be evaluating based on what is this person doing with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The next thing he says is this, if we go down in this passage back in 1 Timothy 1, he says, uh, instruct them not to teach any false, uh, not to introduce any new doctrine. And he says, nor to devote themselves to myths, and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardships from God that is by faith. Now this is interesting. One of the things we see with false teachers all the time, false teachers major in the minors. They get really caught up in things that don't matter a whole lot. And the reason they do that is because the gospel is clear. And if, you, if, they, if they, you know, sometimes it's easy to see when someone's broaching the gospel. But when they start getting you off into these weird side things and they get you into, they, they, they get you into these things that don't matter, that's where a false teacher can do a lot of damage. Now, here's the problem. I'm going to say this real clear. No false teacher will ever say to you, hey, come to my Bible study. We're going to major in the minors. You know what they're going to say to you? Come to my Bible study. We're going to go really deep. We're going to find some really deep truths in the Word. 
listen, by the way, we need to look for the deep truths of the word. We need, to, we need to study the word faithfully. But I want you to understand this. This is a guiding principle. God is not hiding the truth from you. God is too gracious to hide his truth from you. So if you have to get out a pick and shovel to find the truth, you probably didn't find the truth. You probably found something else. But so often what they want to do is they want to get in, they, they confuse depth and minutia. And they say, we're going we're to focus like a laser on this little thing here. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of things. And these aren't bad necessarily unless you let them go too far. You don't know how many times I've been asked, Pastor Jack, what's your opinion on the Nephilim or the Nephilim? You got anybody know who they are? Okay, yeah, they're, they're mentioned twice in Scripture. And we don't get any information about them. But there'll be people who will dig and dig and dig. They're giants. They were the giants in the land. And people will dig and dig and dig. And here's what I'll tell you this. It might be interesting to look at for a little bit, but do you realize that if you understand everything there is to know about the Nephilim, you will not be one step closer to Jesus? Or people who study the Scripture say, you know what, I'm going to figure out when Jesus is coming back because I think it's in here somewhere. You figure out the day he's coming back, you're still not a step closer to Jesus if you haven't accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or you get off into these side things and you say, you know what, it's, it's just so fascinating. The other one we always talk about, and I get myself in trouble with this one, talk all the time about, Jack, do you believe people have free will or do you believe they're elected by God to salvation? And you know what I always say? Yes. <laughs> I believe they are. I believe they're absolutely elected. I believe they absolutely have free will. I just don't understand how it works. And Pastor Clark and I were working my ordination a long time ago when I was young long time ago and we came to a question they wanted me to explain my view of this and my I told him kind of my understanding but then I said and smarter people than me have not figured it out and I'm not going to either and I'm not going to waste any time on it and Pastor Clark laughed at me he said don't say that in your exam <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing the secret things belong to the Lord and we're just banging our head against the wall sometimes trying to find them out. And false teachers get a hold of that. And they, almost every cult starts with deep teaching. We're going to show you something you've never seen before. I, just, I, I listen to podcasts. I listen to one when they're talking about Jim Jones. He started out with deep teaching. I'm going to take you somewhere nobody else has taken you. David Kresh, I've got special revelations from God. I'm going to take you somewhere where nobody else has taken you. Throughout history, there's this this idea that they're, they're finding things that nobody else has found. And one of the things my wife always says to me, if nobody's found it in 2,000 years, it's probably not there to be found. But they major in the minors because what happens is these things don't actually matter. They're not dealing with the things that matter. They're dealing with the things that are peripheral. And often what they do is they take you into somewhere where you can study and you can seek knowledge and not be challenged to change your life one whit. Often this deep teaching gives us knowledge but doesn't actually take us anywhere of value. So false teachers tend to major in the minors. Here in, in Ephesus, they're looking at genealogies. They're looking at, at, spec, at things that create speculation and myths. And Paul says, our job is not to speculate our job is to be stewards of the truth that's already been given us. We have the gospel. Our job is to preach that gospel, to hold on to that gospel, to conserve that gospel for the next generation. And the things that are hidden are going to remain hidden. So they, they major in the minors. False teachers also, um, they teach out of ignorant pride. Paul says here about these guys, he says, um, He says, desiring to be teachers of the law, this is verse 7, without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertion. He says, these guys, these false teachers, they come in and what they want to do is they want to be seen as teachers of the law. In other words, they want to be seen as important. They want to be seen as the person who has the answers. What they're teaching for is they're teaching for the accolades of men. They're teaching for their pride to be, to be puffed up. And by the way, any of you who teach, you know that's a temptation. To want to be the one who has the answers. It says these guys, they, want to des they desire to be teachers of the law, but they don't understand what they're teaching. They're ignorant. 
They want to be seen as important, but they're ignorant. They haven't taken the time to study, to know the law. And I find, I find the next phrase just fascinating. He says, without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. You ever notice someone doesn't know what they're talking about? <sighs> Can make some pretty confident assertions. I've often felt I wish I could go back to being as wise as I was as a freshman in college. Because <laughs> at that point I knew everything, but I knew nothing. But the less knowledge you have, or all, sometimes just a little bit of knowledge, can be very dangerous because you can become confident. I also thought of the, the, the adage of lawyers, when the law is on your side, argue the law. When the facts are on your side, argue the facts. When neither are on your side, argue louder. And that's what he's talking about. These guys, hey, you know what? They don't know what they're talking about. They're ignorant, but they're going to make confident assertions. Years ago, someone said to me, if you're sitting under a teacher and they have it all figured out, double check. I don't know about you guys, but I find the scripture of God something that opens my mind every time I look at it. And if I ever get to the point where I understand all of it from beginning to end, I probably have missed something. But these false teachers, they want to be seen as teachers. They want to be important, but they're ignorant and they're loud. And here's the danger for that for us. We are often attracted to the most confident voice. I can't tell you how many times I've been told by somebody, I love so-and-so because he always gives a strong answer. That's great if his answer is right. But often his answer can be strong and incorrect. False teachers teach with ignorant pride. And here's the crazy thing about that. Do you remember what James, the brother of Jesus, told us about teachers? James chapter 3, verse 1. You can turn there with me if you like, but James 3, 1. James warns this, says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. If you ever think, you know, I want to be a teacher because that will make me important, don't do it. If you're not called to it, don't do it. Because there's a stricter judgment for those who try to divide the Word of God and share it with people in a way that will make a difference in their lives. Later on in this passage, Paul says this. He says they, they want to be seen as teachers of the law. They, want, they, want to, they make confident assertions, but they don't even understand really what the law is all about. Because what appears to be happening here is these guys are probably saying something along the lines that, hey, if you, if you keep the law, you'll be holy. And Paul says this to them. He says the law is good if it's used properly. Verse 8. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and the sinful, the unholy and the irre irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. This is one of those false teachings that's really out there, this idea that we have to keep the law, the law's going to make us better. I want you to understand something. Jesus already fulfilled the law. And the law will never make you one more iota righteous because that was never the purpose of the law. You know the purpose of the Old Testament law always was? To show you how bad you were. To make clear to you that you couldn't keep the law that every one of us fell short of keeping the law. The law is there to show us our sin so that we realize that we need a Savior. And too often we grab a hold of the law and say, if I just keep this, it's going to make me more holy. No, it's not. Jesus has already made you as holy as you can be. Because in God, when God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. The fulfilled law has already been credited to your account. Now, that doesn't mean we don't try to live holy lives. That doesn't mean that we don't look at the law and see the things that please God and the things that displease God. But what it means is this. Keeping those law elements will never make you holy. It will never make you better. All right, so they, they, they teach in, in uh, ignorant pride. I promise we're going to finish up here real quick. I apologize. We're running a little bit late. But here's the other thing. False teachers produce the wrong fruit. Look at what Paul says is the desire of the gospel, the desire of proper teaching. In verse 5, he says, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart 
and a good conscience and a sincere faith. What does Paul say the, re the response to the teaching of the gospel should be? It should be love. Look at that again. Because I think it's so important that we understand this. The response to proper teaching should be a growth in love. Not a growth in knowledge. Not a growth in activity. A growth in love. Love is the center of the gospel. Remember when Jesus was asked, hey, can you sum up the whole law? Remember what he said? Love God, love people. Love is the center of the gospel. When we, when, when we are responding properly to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know what's going to happen? Every day we're going to love God more, and every day we're going to learn to love the people around us more. But see, the false teachers aren't teaching towards love. The false teachers are producing a different fruit. False teachers might be producing knowledge. By the way, to make really clear, knowledge is a bad substitute for love. If you know a whole bunch of stuff but you're not loving, it's not going to be very good testimony of Christ, right? If you have a whole bunch of information stuffed into your head but has never gotten to your heart, it's not going to make much difference in your witness or even in your walk. The goal of our instruction is love. So what are we going to do here? I'm going to, I'm going to wrap it up here real quick, but I want you to hear something. Why are, the, why are this false teaching so dangerous? Why is this false teaching so dangerous that Paul left his beloved son, the one that he, he loved to travel with, he says, instead of you going with me, I want you to stay here to combat this false teaching. Why is it so, so big? First is this. Every false teaching pollutes the gospel. The gospel is an amazing thing. It's the most powerful thing in the entire universe. It changes lives. It radically redefines everything. But here's the deal. The gospel only works if the gospel is pure. Once the gospel starts getting polluted, it stops being powerful because it stops being the gospel. And we as a church need to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ with all we have. Don't let anybody add to it. Don't let anybody take away from it because here's the deal. If we lose the gospel, we've lost everything. There's no purpose for us without a gospel. And the gospel can get polluted so easily by adding or subtracting or anything else. And really quickly, I was thinking, you know, everybody knows what H2O is, right? H2O is water. We love water. Water is good for us. Well, some of us prefer something other than water, but it's good for us, right? Water nourishes our body. You know, if you add another oxygen atom to it, it becomes H2O2. Seems like adding more would be good, like adding more sprinkles to the ice cream. Oven. Not really. H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. Now, we have, high, we have low concentration of hydrogen peroxide in our house to clean things, but you realize if you drink straight hydrogen peroxide, it's a poison. If you add something to water, it ceases to be pure, ceases to be good for you. Same thing with the gospel. If you add something to it, it ceases to be good for you. Same, same scenario the other way. You remove the oxygen, hydrogen is not healthy for you either. Okay? The gospel has to be pure in order to be powerful. The other thing is this. And this is what that gets us the most. It distracts us from the mission that we've been called to do. Paul says, you know, some of these people have gotten caught up. Certain persons, by swerving from the gospel, have wandered away into vain discussion. What that means is they're sitting around and they've gotten so caught up in the minutia and all, these, all this deep teaching that they're sitting around trying to figure out how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. Doesn't matter. Those are vain discussions, discussions that have no answer, discussions that don't move the gospel of Jesus forward, that don't change lives. Those are things that can distract us because of false teaching. We need to be aware of it. And so what do we do? What do we have to do to protect and defend against it? First is this. When you hear a teaching, when you hear a teaching, I'm sorry. The last one, I'm sorry, is that it, it actually... Uh, produces the wrong fruit, which we've already covered. But when you, in order to defend against false teaching, what do we need to do? We need to, check against, we need to check all teaching against the Word of God, which, by the way, requires that we know the Word of God enough to see the counterfeits. And the way we do that is not by studying the counterfeits, but by studying the Word of God. We need, to, we need to be like the Bereans and say, all right, I hear this teaching. Now let me take out my scriptures. Let me examine it. Let me make sure it works. And you know what's going to happen sometimes? You're going to hear a teaching that's a little bit different than something you've heard before, and you're going to take out the Word of God, and you're going to say, you know what? Hey, they're right. I need to change my thinking. 
Other times you're going to hear it and you're going to say, that sounded so good, but when I look at the Word of God, it's not right. But we need to check it against the Word of God. We need to check the fruit that's being produced. If you're sitting under a teaching and what it's doing is it's producing in you anything other than greater love for God and greater love for people, you need to check to make sure you're getting true teaching. True teaching won't produce fear. You know what's amazing? You know, the, you know what people are constantly peddling these days is fear. You turn on your TV this afternoon, you know what you're going you're gonna to be told? You're going to be told you need to be afraid. You need to be very, very afraid because all these bad things are happening. I want to tell you something. As the people of God, you have nothing to fear because our God is in control. And Jesus says to us, in this world you'll have trials of many kinds, but what? Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. If you're seeing anger or hatred or fear being produced, you're not getting the gospel. You're not getting the thing that God wants you to get. He wants you to grow in love. By the way, love isn't namby-pamby. Sometimes love has to be strong, right? Love means we tell the truth to people. Love means we, produce, we point out sin in order that they can repent and be saved. But love is the goal, not judgment. And the other thing is this. We need to rebuke and refute false teaching. When we come across false teaching, don't say, well, I really like that guy. He's so nice. I I'm going to give him the bit of that. No, if the gospel's wrong, think about this. In the book of Acts, there's a young man named Apollos. He comes, he's preaching. He's doing a great job. Everybody's amazed by him. He's such a great speaker. But Priscilla and Aquila grab him. They pull him aside and say, listen, you need to understand, you don't have the full gospel. You don't understand all of it. You, 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 you're missing a part here. You're just preaching about John. You're, you're not getting the whole thing. And they tell him the truth, and he, gets, he accepts the full gospel, and he becomes a mighty speaker on behalf of the things of the Lord. Sometimes we're afraid, that we're, we're afraid to talk to people when they've got something wrong because we're afraid they'll be offended, but you realize you might be the hand of God in their life pointing them in the right direction. But we need to make sure that we understand what the truth is, and we need to understand that when we see the falsehood, we don't let it slide. We say, that's not true, and this is why. Now, please, line up with the true gospel. The gospel is amazing. The gospel is powerful. The gospel will turn the world upside down. The gospel will change your life. It will change everything you see. But only if we keep it pure and we proclaim it faithfully. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your gospel. We thank you for your truth. We ask that you help us to stand strong in your truth, to trust your truth alone. Help us to be vigilant against subtle false teachings or even subtle preferences in our heart that drive us away from what you would have us proclaim. And we ask, Lord, you'll use your gospel in our hearts to grow us in love and in grace towards others and in faithfulness towards you. And that through this, we'll see many people come to know you as Lord and Savior. In Christ's name.